this is the most consistently I have ever prioritized my financial well-being. I've found that it is incredibly grounding Mm. and healing and freeing. And I find that creating that kind of masculine container of financial sovereignty, financial understanding, and financial abundance is really nurturing to make space for that more feminine flow. In today's busy world, how can we find the inspiration, knowledge, and energy to live a healthy and empowered life? If we balance and harmonize our mind, exercise our body, live according to the laws of nature, and connect to spirit, can we find a way to heal, become our authentic self, and live our purpose with love? I am your hostess, Amy Fournier. And welcome back to Awakening Aphrodite. Wow. Oh, man. I just have to tell you, I am recording this intro for Annie Mahler, which was an amazing show. But uh, I almost didn't do this because I was so tired and just had a lot going on and just had no energy and uh, was way too late to have a cup of coffee or anything like that. And uh, I jumped in my sauna and I turned on my red photon lights just for about like 10, 12 minutes max. And bam, I just instantly got this huge burst of energy. Ah, I started breathing and just almost just within a few minutes, I was like, oh my God, I feel like I'm coming back to life. And I, it wasn't even a long time. Like I said, it might've been 12 minutes max, like 10. And uh, I feel like I took a nap. And I think what happened was, is like my cells basically got reset was like taking a nap. They got cleaned out. It helps to detoxify me. It sends all that good frequency to the mitochondria and gives me energy, which is uh, just such a beautiful thing. I talk about it all the time, about how much I love the photon lights and my sauna from Sauna Space on my Instagram, Fit Amy TV, um, because you just have to tell people about something that just works so amazingly good. By the way, if you want to find out more about all that and what the heck I'm even talking about, that's episode 162 with the founder of Sauna Space, Brian Richards. And we talk about the importance of light therapy and how light is an important nutrient for your cells. Helps with weight loss, detox, sleep, energy, moods, all that kind of stuff. But anyway, today's show is Awesome. I am excited to share this show with you because this is my new friend and a mentor in some regards, Annie Mahler. Annie is a successful intuitive coach as well as now has a brand new business um, in the financial world, which I'm getting involved in as well. And uh, But her origins are very interesting, which is part of why I wanted to share them with you. There are many reasons why I wanted Anne on the show. First of all, the more I get to know her, and I've known her less than a year, the more I'm impressed by her and the deeper and deeper the layers of her uh, talents and depth go. And um, she started out as an actress in New York City and is a beautiful singer. And she had a major pivot in her career, like so many of us did when the pandemic hit back in March of 2020. And I, that's a big reason why I want to share her with you, because a lot of people found themselves questioning their life choices and how they were spending their time and what's important and all that kind of stuff. So she left New York and uh, got into intuitive coaching. And now her mission is to offer and inspire human connection and expression sp- straight from the heart and soul. and. Uh, You know, it's an amazing journey that she has because she was a book editor and uh, also classically trained soprano with a BA in English from Yale University. I knew she was a smarty. (laughs) And it's her firm conviction, though, that what the world needs most is each of us in our purest, bravest, most honest, and most open form just to be ourselves. And she also feels that in order to do that, we all need grounding and we need currency, meaning we need the financial ability to do that, to express our soul. 
And this is the other reason why I wanted Annie on the show. Because like her, I have had to have a crash course on finances and economy with what is going on in the world these days. The value of the dollar is plummeting. I'm sure I don't have to tell you that. You, you, the dollar gets less, right? Everything is more expensive. Inflation is out of control. So she is into this new venture, which she's going to come on and tell us about in part two. So today we get into Annie telling us about her story and how she pivoted her career. And we talk about how she taps into her intuition and uses that as a big component of her work and her life to this day. So this is what I need you to do. Subscribe to the show so you get notified when Annie's coming back on the show to share with us the importance, particularly of women, to understand money, understand currency. Because here's the bottom line message, folks. If you're not grounded in security, which is your root chakra, which is your ability to provide and take care of yourself, to meet your needs, to be able to buy healthy food, to be able to pay your rent, to live in a place that's safe, and to buy the things that you need to support yourself, then you will never have a sense of well-being and stress that's under control. So it's critical that we understand finances and we get that dialed in. And this is also critical in order for us to tap in and to liberate the feminine essence that's in us because we can't feel joyful and buoyant and light and airy and fun and imaginative and creative and flirty and all that kind of stuff if we're stressed out and worried about paying the bills, right? This is why it's critical and why I'm totally into it and why Annie is my mentor in this regard. And you need to smash that subscribe button so you are notified when Annie's coming back on to share with us how her and I are both doing just that in this very scary economic day and age. We are securing our finances so we can keep on rocking it. All right. So let's now join Annie Mahler. And by the way, if you really want to support me, there's two ways to do it. Okay. You can subscribe and share this show and you can leave that review. Okay. Which really helps. Why haven't you left a review? Okay. It really helps me. <laughs> and also you can buy any of the products that I promote, uh, either through the Instagram channel, through here, the podcast or on my website, because I get a very small commission on some of those and it helps to support the expenses of the show. Trust me, it doesn't even get close to paying the bills for this show to provide it for you for free, but every little bit helps. And when you purchase through my links, I get a very small commission on that. And I appreciate that so much because like I said, it all helps, right? Okay. It's my pleasure to bring this with you. I'm super grateful that you're here with us. I love you guys. I'm thrilled to share with you my new friend and mentor, Annie Mahler. Annie, I'm so thrilled to have you on the show. I have been a big fan of yours growing by the day, the more I get to know you. And uh, gosh, it hasn't even been a year yet, but I don't know. I feel like I I know you so much better or deeper <laughs> than just the short amount of time that I've known you. Of course, I've known of your mother for a long time, like many people have. But uh, I just have to start saying how grateful I am because you are a busy lady in demand. You're taking off like a rocket ship. <laughs> and for you to make time to come on Awakening Aphrodite and share some of your wisdom with, with us, I truly appreciate it. So welcome, Annie. Welcome to the show. Where are you located? Oh, well, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And I am in Southern Coastal Maine. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I was in New York City prior to 2020, but I grew up in Maine. And when things started to get all wonky in uh, 2020, I decided to <laughs> get out of there. Uh, and come come back to Maine. Yeah, perfect. And you know, I was really shocked because on uh, you know we're in a, we're in a group together, which we'll talk about on a show. Um, and you had done a little singing bit because uh, you know probably from your mother you, you inherited a lot of the spiritual sense and that deep connection mm -hmm. to spirit and uh, so many talents and abilities in, in, in addition to your vast intelligence, but uh, you sung for us. You did a little song, and I was just like, wait, what? 
oh my gosh, who who put an angel on the call? Like, what is I'm, I'm hearing like bells and stuff. Like, wow. So tell us about your life in New York City, the 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 pre-pandemic Annie life. Like sure. you, you were a singer and professional actress. Yeah. So I I mean, I started working professionally as an actor when I was 15 here in Maine in regional theater. And then I moved to New York after college to, I mean, I studied theater, you know, did tons of stuff in school, out of school, blah, blah, blah. And then I um, moved to New York to become a professional. My dream was Broadway. Uh, That didn't actually happen. Maybe it still will. I was getting pretty close before, you know, before things shut down temporarily. And yeah, my life in New York was very a full and busy and sort of flying by the seat of my pants a lot of the time. And yeah, so I'm a classically trained soprano. So I've been studying voice for a very long time. My One of my first teachers, actually my very first voice teacher, I just reconnected with recently. She is on the same page about some of the things we believe in and is now uh, in another state. And I think she's like a She's some sort of healer. But anyway, my second voice teacher is still alive and well. He's 80 something and just incredible. So, but in New York, I was auditioning, taking classes, working when I could. I did some regional theater. I did some independent film, web TV, stuff like that. And I also had all kinds of different things that I did to pay the bills in between. I was an executive assistant. I was a legal proofreader. I was a freelance editor. And I also uh, did coaching and intuitive work. So all kinds of things and cobbled together a life and a community. And and then, um, and I, I feel really grateful for the time that I had there. I learned a ton and had amazing experiences. Some heartbreaking and some exhilarating and everything in between. And then, you know, I just uh, decided I needed to leave because things were seeming so un- uh, so unpredictable. And now I've just sort of been in regrouping around all of that. I'm still an artist, but the business of being, uh, trying to make it in the matrix Hollywood was, has lost its charm for me. So, (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it was the pandemic that got you out. Precisely. Yep. I literally got, I think I literally got one of the last planes out of the city in March of 2020. Wow. Before they locked everything down. Yeah. And, and, and it was because what they were requiring you to get the experimental. Not yet. No. So what was, it was really just that I was hearing from some people that they might like close the borders to the city. And I realized that probably sounds irrational, but for me, though I had lived through some challenging times in the city, like my first summer in New York was a, uh, a blackout and I was there for one of the big hurricanes and da-da. And I found there was something about the spirit of New Yorkers coming together that in a crisis that yeah. I actually loved. Yeah. But I also, the idea of being stuck there when my family is all in Maine, that just yep. really didn't feel good to me. So um, yeah, it was before all the rollouts of the um, medical mandates. I just felt like I should leave so that I could be closer to my family in case I just didn't know what was going to happen. So that was, mm-hmm. that was, what ha- that was why I left. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, right. I literally packed the biggest bag suitcase I had and left my apartment and I never went back. I, I had all my stuff moved out of my Brooklyn apartment. I was just going to say, what about all your stuff? You abandoned yeah. it. Okay. You actually went, you had people go in and just move uh-huh. your stuff. Yeah. And is that because you didn't want to go back or you were afraid to go back? Cause you get stuck. It was, or- no, it was just more like, I, I didn't want to. It was just easier to just have it just done. And this is kind of weird, but you just trusted people not to steal your stuff. Like you're, just, you know what I mean? Oh like, yeah. You know what I mean? You're going to put it in the boxes. You sure you get all my stuff? Oh, there? wow. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. That didn't occur to me. I mean, I was living, I didn't <laughs> have like myself. a lot of valuables, you know, yeah. I was living yeah. in a three bedroom apartment in Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, you know, it was, Yeah. Yeah, you're good. No, you're better off. Now that I uh, have some 
gold and silver, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Different day and age. Yeah, it was a different and, time. Yeah. And I had certainly, my computer. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's a different economy too. People are yes. more and more desperate with growing, yes. growing time. But uh, yeah. that that that's awesome. Okay, so total pivot. And this yes. is one of the things I love about you is that, uh, you know, now you found this whole new genre. You know, there's so many people who, with the pandemic, you know, had a crisis of conscience, a crisis of finance, a crisis of family, of belief, of value. I mean, it it brought a lot of things to, the, to a head. And I talk about this a lot that, you know, the the silver lining of a lot of this is it exposed a lot of what's been going on yes. behind the scenes, which is super painful, but mm -hmm. wow, what a blessing to at least be now aware of it, that we're calling it out. Now we can actually do something about it, you know? Mm -hmm. So you were one of the many, like me, who had a big pivot once the pandemic came and you shifted, like you just explained to us and that you moved to Maine. So did you stop acting? Like what happened and how did you now find this new life for yourself? Because again, a lot of the audience found themselves in this position. Yeah, sure. And so I can sort of speak fairly freely about- Of course, hundred so percent. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, well, what happened was I still, um, my acting, I had been studying with the same acting teacher for a few years at that time. And he kept, he sort of took a break and then we went on to zoom. So I was, and he did that partially to kind of give us some support and continuity and fellowship, but also, you know, to keep us engaged in, in our craft. Right. So I still, um, did that every week for probably the first two years. And that kind of helped me stay connected to that part of myself. And then, um, I, was sort of a lot, most auditions went remote, but I kind of, it wasn't really my, my focus aside from class because first I was, when I first left the city, I was actually helping take care of my grandmother on the, um, in a small town outside of Buffalo, New York, where she was. So I was oh. working a remote day job, helping with my grandmother. Then I came, then I came home and my mom had just lost her partner, which anybody who follows her knows about that. Um, so there was a lot of family stuff going on. So I was basically just working my temp day job, helping my family and going to class. And then I sort of the timing that, and I also was becoming more and more, I was always clued in about holistic health and shots and all of that because of the family I grew up in, but I didn't understand. I had no idea how connected everything was and how I just, I mean, I definitely had, have had a lot of awakening and awareness in the past few years that I didn't have before. And I had had a few sort of seeds planted, um, partially by my mother. Cause she's, you know, listened to and read sort of out, like out aside the box things forever, but she's my mom, right? So I'm sometimes like, yeah, whatever. I'm going to go learn my lines. You yeah. watch that yeah. documentary. There, whatever. there she goes again. Yeah, there she goes again. <laughs> yeah. But I also actually did have a, a, somebody I was, I dated for a while who also, he had a particular guru who predicted some things, not necessarily about the virus, but just some things. And he had said to me, probably a couple of years before 2020, you need to leave the city. It's not going to be safe to be in cities. We're going to be going through such and such. And I was like, come on, I'm trying to like live my life in New yeah. York and pursue my dreams, whatever you're being dramatic. But he, you know, they were right. So everything was kind of starting to make more sense in a different way. And it just so happened that I, so then I became more involved in like the medical freedom um, movement here in Maine, I uh, got pretty involved in actually um, some of the organization ad and administration of Maine Stands Up, which is the organization that my mom co-founded, because I had a background in like the 12-step community in New York City, and I had a fairly specific sense of how things should be run. <laughs> and so I just decided to help. So that in that process, I, I got involved in that. And then I, of course, learned more and more and more from those people. And then it just sort of coincided that that, as I was getting more awake, and then the mandates came out. 
And I was literally, and you know, if anybody from my acting class ever sees me, you know, on this, which they probably won't, but you know, (laughs) but literally it was getting to the point in my class where we were having to um, say our vaccination status. And I started to feel, I literally started to feel sick to my stomach, like in those, in those moments, it just, it just, I I felt sad about it. Right. And the reason we were doing that was because it was a, a class that's like preparing for auditions. It's an audition class and you had to say your status for on camera auditions. And so also in between I had been invited to be involved in a gold and silver uh, community and uh, business. And so as that started to expand, I just decided to take a break from trying to figure out how to um, get somewhere in the matrix, corrupt Hollywood, whatever. And at the same time, I was seeing more and more clearly the propaganda in like the TV shows and the movies. And I was like, oh my God, these things that I've been, these, you know, shows that I've loved for years, I just started to see the agenda more than I ever had before. So yeah, that was what happened. It, the co- things just sort of coincided in a certain way. And, and so I decided to um, just set that particular thing aside for now and uh, come, you know, come back to it on my own terms in my own way. But I think that I feel like I'm going all over the place, uh, which is just the nature of the way my mind no, works. No, you're not. It's, <laughs> I'm following you. I'm right. Okay, good. Mm-hmm. I, but I, you know, it's interesting because I noticed that in retrospect, I noticed that I kind of went, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to participate in the acting business anymore because of the mandates, which is true. But also, I had trouble fitting into that world anyway, before 2020, you know, it's not like I already had some big established career that I was throwing away. I was getting somewhere and I had worked and I was, I actually, yesterday was my 15 year anniversary as a member of the actors union. Um, So that was interesting, but I think there were ways in which I have a friend who's an, uh, a singer songwriter out in LA and she had also like had sort of close calls with success, but never fully made it. And she always says she was spared. And I sometimes feel, at at first when she said that, I was like, I don't know if I feel that way. I really just wanted to be a star. Uh But now more and more and more, I'm starting to feel like I agree with her because um, there's just, and I'm not saying that I will never do anything in mainstream as an actor. I, I I would still like to, but there's this way in which like having that ideal of the acceptance in that world, it just like, compl- the more that I saw the, the darkness and the compromise-ness of that world, the less that that, the less important that became to me. Um, and the more acceptance I had of, the ways in which things had not the ways, the ways that things went for me and didn't go for me, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, it's, I feel now more like my journey has been one of, I'm a deeply sensitive, empathic, intuitive person. And it's, quite possible that if I had had the trajectory that I thought I was going to have, I would have totally fallen apart. Self-destruct. Yeah. Well, I've got to say, I knew I related to you for a reason because we're alike (laughs) in that regard. Hey, everybody. Hope you're enjoying the show. I'm here with my friend Hannah of Seab and Solace. Hannah, you've talked a lot about how uh, the skin can be related to what's going on mentally and emotionally for us and even our immune system. And you actually had that personal experience yourself. So you know firsthand the result of PTSD and eczema personally. Can you just help us understand how there's a connection there between our mental, emotional, and what our skin is doing, acne, eczema, rashes, any other skin problems? 
I was born during the war in Iran and that created a constant battle of fear of anticipating dying as a young kid instead of having normal, playful and active imagination as a kid. And your nervous system is an extension of our immune system. And when our immune system gets compromised, this essentially can affect your skin. You basically um, start to show skin issues such as eczema, psoriasis, heavy, heavy itching. And that's because your nervous system has been affected. As a child, I noticed that both me and my sister had we were battling heavily with eczema on our face and our scalp, not knowing what's happening. We, my mother took us to an herbalist and they were able to tell us that they, they need to be on heavy amounts of mugwort seeds and saffron to calm the nervous system down and detox the gut. So we would reduce and eradicate the, the signs of eczema and itching. Let's talk about the benefits of mugwort seeds. And that's what makes your company unique, Hannah, is that you sell the Persian mugwort seeds as opposed to the leaves, which can be common with some other herbal companies. These are known as golden seeds in, in Iran because they're considered the king of all seeds. And this ancient Persian detox has been passed down through generations. It's a one-stop source of nutrients your body needs to detox liver and purify the blood cells. What happens, these seeds detox your gut and your liver, which then allow for healthier red blood cells that act as a medium culture for all of our 50 trillion cells. So this allows our immune systems for growth and repair, which we need on a regular basis. I have a mugwort seed hot tea with a little, a couple of strands of uh, your Persian saffron in there too, probably about three mornings a week. I absolutely love it. I'm really not a big tea fan, but I've become one. <laughs> and I just love knowing I'm doing something good for my body and supporting another woman-based business and somebody that has ethics and morals and is giving back to the planet and does things holistically. So thank you for your amazing products, Hannah. Thank you, Amy. And you can get your own, you guys. Save 10% because Hannah has given us a coupon code, FITAMYTV10, all caps, at checkout. And you can try it and save and let me know and let's drink mugwort together. I, uh, I'm very close personal friends with Paul Check, and uh, he's my most of my audience knows who he is. He's pretty much the grandfather of holistic health and yes. wellness, and um, he's also a mentor of mine. And uh, he always says that that I was spared because mm. I had the same thing in health and fitness. I mean, the same, just really close dancing with that edge. You yes. know, I did TV commercials and mm -hmm. covers of magazines and the whole deal. Yes. You know, working at, you know, best clubs in Miami, Boston, all that. And, but never really broke through. And I even did some acting too. I yeah. mean, the whole, the whole deal. I lived in Miami. I was modeling. I mean, yeah. the whole thing, but just didn't break through. Mm -hmm. And Paul would say, you know, you were spared. You couldn't have handled it. And there's yes. no, there's no question. Of course, I, you know, argue vehemently with him. Of course I could have. Yeah, I can handle it. Yes, yeah. of course. But now I really see, um, even at this point in my life that, and sometimes I think that's why I haven't manifested my dream house yet after mm -hmm. three years is mm -hmm. because, and I had this, I had this revelation just the other day because I put an offer in the house. I thought it was the one and I didn't get it. And I was absolutely devastated. I was so devastated and so pissed that yeah. I, I literally had to cancel work for a day because I couldn't function. I was so upset. But then I, I, I got clear and still and deep with my soul and I and I had a moment of I saged myself of course yes <laughs> and I I had a moment of grace where it came over me that you need to think about what's good about you not getting that house yes and I just started writing Annie I had 12 things in a matter of two minutes mm -hmm. really significant things like I had a really tough conversation with my mother mm -hmm. I had a tough conversation with my accountant. I just like a couple things. And one of the main things was my soul told me that we were showing you what you can have. Cause yeah. I felt like I was teased and it was pulled away. Yeah. Like, yeah. here you go. Yes. Nope. You can't have it. And you, that probably happened to you with parts like, Oh, I'm going to get that. Oh part. yeah. Yeah. And, and you were like, I got it. And you're like, no, I didn't get it. Yeah. But what my soul told me was 
you're not ready because we know as soon as we give you this house, you're just going to hit the ground running and start all your crap and start all your programs and do your class. You know, you're not going to be doing what you need to do to mm. get your foundation very, very set and clear mm. because you will self-destruct. And that's yeah. exactly what would have happened to me if I ever made it big yes. time. Yes. In, you know, and so this is just really quite a quite a beautiful gift to hear you saying this because I didn't realize you were in that same position. Yeah. And you know, I actually it's funny what you said about the tease, the tease thing. Yeah. I I mean it happened like literally. So I in October of 2020, no, October 2019. So in the summer of 2019, I got like my best sort of representation agent, you know, through a friend. Um and she was submitting me to things. And then in October of 2019, I had an audition to understudy three leading roles in a musical about a musical that was, um, it was called a uh, girl from the North country. It did, it did actually come out on Broadway during the plant, the pandemic. Um, and it, but it was a Bob Dylan musical. It's a musical based on the, the songs of Bob Dylan and it's beautiful. Oh, and anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I had this audition to understudy three roles and I totally, if I do say so myself, did an exquisite job. Yeah, and, you know, um, you know, they were very impressed and did it. I didn't get, I didn't get it because you know, I wasn't what they were looking for or whatever, but I was very prepared and did it. And I felt wow. more centered than I'd ever felt in an audition yeah. Yeah. experience and after the audition as well. Um, and so I felt like I was, and it was so interesting because I was in this, in the waiting room because it was by appointment and only from people with agents. And it was like a whole different vibe among the actors waiting for the audition than like open calls where, you can just like almost anybody can sign up. People were so much more respectful and okay. supportive of each other than at the open calls, which was fascinating. I felt like I'd like entered a whole other level, a whole other, it was fascinating. So anyway, that happened in October, 2019. And then, you know, spring of 2020, uh, it was like, okay, you're not staying here. You're, we're done. We're, you know, and of course I could have made another choice and, you know, decided to compromise my DNA and co go back, but I just wasn't, wasn't going to make that choice. Not to mention so, the future. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I do know that there are people who have gotten a fake or whatever. And I have, con I have considered that more than once, but I, I, I'm not, my integrity is really important to me. It really, really is. Yes. And I just... I, that feels so wrong. I just mm -hmm. have not been willing to do that, especially mm -hmm. because it's, you know, the, how it affects other people, you know, like I read this <clears throat> report from, I don't even remember who it was, but it was somebody who actually was a broker of the fake cards in, in LA. And, and he said that, um, you know, and of course he was anonymous cause you know, but he said, a lot of the people, the celebrities who are touting this have the fake card. And I just, mm -hmm. a lot of doctors. Yep. Yeah, a lot of doctors. It's so wrong. It's so mm -hmm. wrong. Mm -hmm. You do, you go, you all go, I'm going to give this message to you. You can all mm -hmm. screw yourselves over and I'm going to have a, a backdoor protection. It's just like, I can't even. No, so, it's beyond. Um, the yeah, level. it's beyond. And the other thing, you know, it's interesting when you said about your, your path as well. And my friend that I'll, I mentioned to you, which I'll tell you more about offline because I don't want to blow up her anonymity, but um, she, so I think there's something about um, beauty, female beauty in the world and in like the, the experience of being a woman and in the businesses that the three of us have been in where there's like a commodification of oh, yeah. beauty and it makes you, it gives you like power sort of, but it also makes you so way. vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And we actually, all three of us even kind of look sort of similar. And I don't know. I just think it's interesting that we have had such similar paths, similar vibe. Yeah. yeah. Because mm -hmm. it is like really, I mean, I remember I'm, this is a total side note, but I remember, um, I had this coaching once with this, uh, vocal coach. So he, a vocal coach is like somebody who 
it's not the vocal technique. It's like the performance part about how to, how to tell the story of the song, right. In an audition. And, and so we were going over my repertoire and he goes, okay, here's the deal. You're a cute, blonde, pretty person. They don't want to hear when you walk in the door, they want to hear something cheerful from you, not something depressing. And I was like, oh, okay. It was such a revelation to me, but it's it's true. It is true because I was doing all these like sad, depressing songs because I'm like very dramatic. But the reason (laughs) I bring that up is because that's the other thing is that we each, whether, I mean, the three of you, me and this other woman, we kind of have a similar type, but it doesn't really matter what your type is in the industries that all three of us have been in. There's all this stuff about like how you look sends a particular message And people are going to have all these ideas and projections based on it. And you can like take that to the bank, maybe, but it also has costs to some degree, right? You know, I mean, have you ever listened to um, Be Reasonable by, with Chris, uh, Chris, what is his last name? I can't remember. It's a podcast on Substack. Okay. He used to be in Hollywood. I don't know what he did, but he, it's called Be Reasonable with Chris somebody or other, super smart. And he has one p- episode called um, An Offer You Can't Refuse. Okay. And it's about this phenomenon that happens in lots of different industries. He happens to use the acting industry because it's the most obvious one of like, you know, you're working, working, working to make these dreams come true. And somebody offers you like the part of a lifetime and then invites you to their hotel room. And it's, you kind of have this thought of, well, it's just one night and duh, right. But then they own you yeah. because they can blackmail you. Right. Oh, that, and well, that's it, probably what happens every day in Hollywood. All the time. So, and I mean, it happens in politics. It happens in business. Mm. Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. So I found it really interesting the way he, the way he. Wow. Yeah. He. Yeah. Draws out the scenario. It, you know, and that brings us back to your point about integrity and yes. and back to the whole pandemic and the state of the world today is, to me, this is really separating the women from the girls. And, Seriously. you know, my one of my favorite quotes of all time, and I really need to look up who said it, is I would rather die on my feet than live on my knees. And, you know, at the end of the day, I have to look myself in the mirror. And another thing I say too, with this whole political correctness thing, like I'm all for live and let live. And, you know, gosh, I mean, Memorial Day is about, we're coming up on Memorial Day as we record this. It's about honoring the people who died for our freedom and for our freedom to speak, even if they disagree with what we're saying. Okay. So say whatever you want, but I defend your right to say it. But my, my point is, is what really gets me, Annie, is the people who don't have the courage to speak their truth because they're afraid of offending people, they're afraid of political correctness, they're afraid of the backlash, they're afraid of the hate, they're afraid of all that. But silence is consent by, by not saying anything. And, I, and that's what you made me think of to your point of, um, you know, back to integrity is it wouldn't have sat well with you to go ahead and get your vaccine fake passport yeah, um, and just kind of go along with it. Cause basically you're kind of consenting to the whole game. So yes. some, someone has to speak up. Like if everybody yeah. does that, then you know what I mean? Like, but collectively it's like, oh. yeah. I mean, it's also like sometimes my friends tease me cause I'm, I'm sort of like obsessive about recycling and composting. Yeah. And like, cause I'm like, okay, is it, I understand that in the larger scheme of things, you know, people, people might say, well, so, you know, the statistics are whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. But to me, I'm like, well, if everybody thinks that, right. I just said that to my niece yesterday, turning off the bathroom light. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And I was like, if everybody said what you said, because she said that, like, oh, it's, you know, she's nine. She's like, it doesn't really matter to one person. I'm like, yeah, it does. Yes, it it does. does. Yeah, it totally does. She's not going to come visit anymore. (laughs) (laughs) No, but I agree. And this is what people have to understand. So help us, Annie. How can we, because I wonder when you left New York, were you always intuitive? Because did you... Was it just that intuitive pull? You knew it because that, come on, that had to be hard for you. You, you might've been on the cusp, but only took one job to get to your famous role. You know, how did you know 
yes, I need to leave. Like you just, it was an immediate gut instinct or was it a slow burn or how do, how do we learn our intuition? Yeah. Well, there are a couple parts to this. So on the one hand, uh, do you know anything about human design? Do you know yes, what you're a, a little, certainly not as you much as you, but. Okay. Um, so I'm a projector in human design okay. and, it, and that is like 20% of the population or something. Um, and our, we're meant to wait for the invitation in general, in like the major decisions in life. And so that means that we're kind of paying attention to where we are being invited places and into opportunities and da, 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 da. So in terms of the specifics of leaving New York, um, honestly, for me, the impetus to leave on, at the time, I really didn't know. I mean, even though I had, so my parents are, could not be more diametrically opposed in their views on what's been going on. So my dad was like, really? oh yeah, he, wow. he's also a physician, but much more conventional. And, and so he was really, he truly was worried about the virus yeah. and my mom was not, but she did think they both thought I should get out of the city. Okay. Um, and at the time, like I was still looking at the, you know, Googling and trying, and I'm working in this um, building in Midtown Manhattan. And I was, I literally was, I was washing my hands like all day, so much so that the backs of my hands were like raw by the time I got out. And I'm not even, I don't even totally believe in the germ theory. I don't, but I just, it was like, I didn't know what was happening. Right. So the main thing was it really, it, I was kind of in a place of, well, um, I, the job where I'm going to have the option of going to the office or working remotely, it's probably going to go remote. I'm living in an apartment with two other roommates in this tiny space. There's no, it was like, um, I don't know, like 50, 60 hours a week. I wasn't going to be able to work that job in that space just on a practical level. Um, so then what happened was I received an invitation from my family to go be on the family property with my grandmother because nobody was there and her um she her faculties she was starting to she was just starting to need more help and this was after you know many decades of being extraordinarily self-sufficient and wow. so and it just so happened that I had had I had a real strong bond with my grandmother and I had had sort of this intuitive thing over the prior year or so that I needed to spend time with her, but I wasn't sure how or when or the logistics of that. And then this invitation landed in my lap. Bring your job here, stay in the house, stay in the family house, use granny's car. She can't drive anymore. And so I just, the invitation showed up. And so I said, yes. But how, excuse me, how, how was bring your job there? You left acting in New York. Was there acting? Oh, in my job, my job at the time was I was temping as a uh, proofreader for an accounting firm. Online. Yeah. It Got was, it. well, it was in the firm and then oh. it went remote. Got it. You could take it mobile. Virus. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. So yeah. So that's what happened. <clears throat> and then, um, yeah. So I just, for me, my intuition is like, it's partially paying attention to what shows up and then partially tuning in to how I feel about that. So, yes. um, like I might, cause I don't say yes to every invitation, right? If I did, I'd like never get anything done. Um, so usually for me, I literally like close my eyes. I, I consider each option. I see how each option feels in my body, especially like my, um, like my pelvic area and sometimes my solar plexus. And uh, sometimes I'll, I pray, sometimes I'm, I meditate and I just ask God. Um, often I'll ask, is there anything else I need to know about this and just see what comes up? My mm -hmm. intuition is pretty uh, uh, auditory um, okay. often. So I will like hear a response of some kind usually. Um, so yeah, that's how, how that worked. And then the decision about not returning to pursuing acting in the way I was because of the shot, that was like, not, it honestly, it wasn't even a question. Like I just was exposed to so much information about the dangers that I couldn't, but I did have, I would say, I will tell you that I did have a couple moments 
because, you know, I'm talking to my friends and I'm like, wow, this is a really big deal. Like I'm letting go of a dream that I've had for yeah over two decades, really. Yeah. Um, and a couple of times pe- people were, well, people did say, well, why don't you just get the f- fake card and da-da. Mm-hmm. I, but I had one, or I remember I had one or two moments where I thought to myself, well, could I just do this so I could just like get it over with? It would be so much more convenient. And as soon as I thought about it for even like five seconds, I felt sick to my stomach. Okay. So you, so you have a very, you have a very strong mind body yeah. connection. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Nausea is like a really quick nausea. A really oh yeah. Fast one or feeling dizzy. Those are two ways. My body talks to me. I get lot. heavy. I get like a oh, drop interesting. Like, okay. and, and tight neck. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Like tension, yeah, exactly. tension, like yeah. pressure. Mm-hmm. Totally. So, um, yeah, so that was, um, how that happened. But in terms of, I mean, did you want me to talk about how I connect, how I found my intuition in general or? Sure. Whatever you feel would be valuable. Sure. Because a lot of people, you know, they just, they, well, it's not clear or they, or, or they talk themselves out of it or they poo poo it. Like, how do we know when it's legitimately your higher self and not your programming, your fears, whatever, you know? Totally. And, you know, I think that that's sort of an ongoing journey for everybody. I still have that question sometimes, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, I do especially with like something that I feel like feels like a big decision or I often second guess myself if it means that I'm going to disappoint somebody. Yeah. If the decision that feels right involves me disappointing somebody, it can be harder for me to trust it. Yeah. Um, But I've, I made some, I've made progress on that over the years. Um, so for me, I did start working, doing intuitive sessions several years ago. I can't remember. I'm not good with time, but um, I'm not either. Another similarity. I'm not either. What even is time? Uh, Um, So it was like, but I think it was probably five years, four or five years before the um, pandemic. So uh, somewhere between three and five. So basically I had been, I think I always had sort of been intuitive, but I didn't really totally understand it. And then what Mm -hmm. happened was Um, we were using this specific type of healing meditation in my family called a divine love meditation, which is right. You're familiar. Your mother did a sub stack on it. Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. So that's created by a scientist named Dr. Robert Fritchie, who has studied the scientific effects of divine love on the body and on like, um, the earth. So (laughs) he sometimes does mass meditations. Like we, I participated in one, gosh, a long time ago about, um, cleaning up the oil, an oil spill. Uh, so anyway, he's science has these scientific processes. And so in my family, we were using that divine love meditation regularly. If somebody was sick or somebody was having surgery or going through a hard time or whatever, we just like get on the phone or in person or whatever with two, three, five, six, whatever of us and do this meditation. And almost every time I would get, and it's a two minute meditation and I would get this like whole movie during the meditation. And we always share with each other what we received. And oftentimes people would be like, whoa, I would say what came through. You mean like no one else got what you got type thing? Like right. you get, or, yeah. well, you know, what's interesting though is, you know, quantum field and everything. Yeah. Very few people get like as much vivid experience imagery as I get, but oftentimes there are, um, themes like, like I'll see something like, let's say for example, in one, maybe I'll see a red bird and I'm doing the meditation with my mom and my sister and my aunt. And like my sister might also see a red bird and you know what I mean? So, but in a different context. So okay. that's really fascinating, but still red bird. I mean, that's, whoa, <laughs> I know like you have a, specific these you know the images mean yeah. something right sure, to the person sure. so what happened was um that was just an interesting thing and my mother said you know you're very intuitive and you could probably make a lot of money with that skill and i was like whoa well whoa but also per <laughs> usual i i'm the oh. oldest of two daughters i just was like I, maybe but i have no idea how to do that anyway moving right along right like <laughs> <laughs> okay, mom. 
good idea, but I have whatever. And then I had a session (laughs) with another psychic. That's funny. And she, I know. Yeah. It's especially because of who she is. Like if she said that to me, I'd be like, I know, but it's different. Right. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I know. Wow. Um, I, but yeah, she, so many things that she said, my sister yeah. got my mom for a mother's day. I think last year, a, t- a dish towel that says like, by the way, my mother was always, was right about everything. Yeah. We could all give that to our mothers. I, I know. It's like, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So then I had a psychic reading with somebody who said you could do what I'm doing. And I was wow. like, Okay. Really? That's two. That's two. two. Exactly. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I said, well, I wouldn't, again, I have no idea how I'd do that. And she said, well, why don't you just, um, offer $20 session, $20, $20 for a 30 minute session to your friends and see what happens. So good I advice. did. Yeah. Good advice. And I had like, it was full, you know, my book was full for those first week or couple weeks wow. and people got a lot out of it. And I was like, okay. So then over time, I just like obviously increased my rates and advertised on social media and da, 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 da. And so that was how that happened. Game on. Yeah. And I, lo- you know what? It was really interesting. I real when I started doing that, it was such a relief because what it felt like was that there was this sort of like stream running under the surface my entire life. And finally I had a place, an outlet for it. It was very interesting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is the key word, the relief. Yeah. Because I think what I hear you're saying is your soul finally was like, finally, yeah. she's living her dharma. Yeah. She's living totally. our truth. She's living our gift. I mean, that's like, wow, such a key word. Relief is, wow, a word I think we all would love to feel. Relief. Powerful. Yeah. Totally. Wow. So, okay. It's, so then what I'm hearing you say is you've always been really tapped into your body because, you know, it's really vogue right now, this whole embodiment movement yes, you've got going, totally. which is very critical for tapping into our feminine and been big part of my journey in the last few years because my story in a nutshell was uh, just over masculinized in my expression of my life. I always was a feminine woman, you know, if I identify as a woman and all that, but um, very much tied into my dad and the work ethic, the Puritan New England work ethic of push it, push it, push it, and don't listen to how you feel. It's more about what you're producing and doing the right thing and sacrifice and all that stuff. So I've had to journey back to my body. And, and plus being an athlete and all that, we overrode our body. I mean, it didn't matter if you were tired or hungry or whatever you had to, you know. So, um, were you always kind of connected strongly to your body to get, because I already hear the audience saying, well, gee, she gets nauseous and she gets, you know, immediate, uh, physical reactions to connect to her higher self, but I don't. So did you always have that? And if, if, if not, or if so, could you maybe help the rest of us who who don't have that strong connection yet to maybe start to cultivate it to hear from our body? Yeah. So, I mean, the short answer is no, I wasn't always like that. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> There's hope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think that, well, it's, I mean, of course, I don't know what I was like as a child. Yeah. As I, you know, there, so I do have a pretty vivid memory of some things, but not all of my, all the ages and stuff. Um. I think for me, I, it became, I became more connected to and aware of that as I was in, in the process of like healing from trauma, basically. So, um, and you know, this is something I've discussed with my mom. It's not like I'm not going to say that she's a horrible human being. She's an amazing human being and an amazing mom. And we had, uh, we had, you know, some, some challenges in my childhood and, Mm -hmm. um, like most people do. Mm -hmm. So, and I came in, I, my sense is that I came in like really tuned in. I was always, I've been described, I was described as an old soul since I was like, tiny. Me too. And then, right. And then like the, 
level of emotional uh, awareness that the adults around me had wasn't in sync with how I came in. Right. So I Mm. found ways to cope. And so I actually, to, so I actually did a lot of, as a child and as an adolescent, I actually checked out a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, right. Like I would just literally space out and, um, I even, it was, and I, I had a pretty strong capacity to sort of, uh, be stoic and just like put on a brave face and be polite and all of those things, probably also partially in New yeah. England, Puritan, right? Yeah. Um, and so, but it was to such a degree that actually there was a family friend, I use the word friend lightly, she wasn't really actually a very kind person, but anyway, she s- described me as like a Teflon pan, that everything just like slid wow. off me, which could not have been further from the truth. But that was my defense mechanisms were so, that was, I was like 14 at the time. That was the appearance, but that's yeah, not the, the reality. Appearance. Mm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So <clears throat> I, so I did not always. Um, I think that I actually, uh, when I started having my period, also at 14, I had, um, I had like bad, really bad cramps and nausea and vomiting from pretty much the very beginning. I think that was my body talking to me from like, that was the, that was my body talking to me. And so, right. So then over the course of the next decade or two, it was a process of like learning what is it, what is it that my body is trying to tell me? Yeah. Because I remember one time I had this acupuncturist I work was working with in New York. And, and I said, you know, there's a part of me that's kind of glad that I get sick like this every month because it's the only way that I can be in my body. Wow. And and it's the only way I can stop. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. I know. Yeah. And so, so it was like that. And then I think, Just like I've attracted, I've been very blessed in so far as, you know, I knew I loved how you did such a beautiful prayer of gratitude before we started. And I would Mm. say, you know, I've been challenged in my life in terms of the sort of complexities of traumas and dysfunctions and whatever that are probably, they're subtle uh, from the outside world, but they're deep. Uh, so those have been challenging, but I have also been very blessed in terms of the, I have attracted a lot of amazing healers and teachers and mentors and guides in my life, like a lot. I've been very blessed in that way. So I think over the course of, you know, my adulthood so far, I just have attracted people into my life who have helped me to come out of denial of the things that were, you know, challenging and to really lean into like, of course, a spiritual awakening, but also like a body-based healing. And some of that is for like actual physical illness, like I described, but some of it is also, um, yeah, just literally feeling what I'm feeling and acting has been acting and singing have been part of it too, because that, I mean, I'm sure it's not going to be shocking to hear like, It's a little hard to be a good actress if you are like Teflon. (laughs) Yeah. You know, because the audience can feel it when you're faking it or if you're really feeling the emotion. Yes. And the authenticity of the. Yeah, exactly. And it's like the defense mechanisms. I I have had to like chip away at them. To feel the feel, to go there. Yes. Yeah. Because there's, it's always there under the surface, Mm -hmm. but to be able to like be in it and be vulnerable in front of other humans, yeah, right? Is the, that's mm. the tricky part. The I V word. <laughs> singing, singing for me has often been a little bit of a, a shortcut for that. Um, yep. I think because it involves like the vibration of the Expression. voice or something, yep. it has always helped me be more vulnerable and more sure. open than uh, just acting. I shouldn't say just acting, but it's just a different, uh, it's just yeah, a different, different modality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm thinking maybe to get more, maybe a practical uh, for people, maybe some, I'm trying to think of like some specific steps. I mean, of, everybody's got their own journey, right? But for me, um, well, one thing, this is just a tool that I have used 
for, this is a tool for like holding my own self and my own space while also being present with somebody else. So I was, I had went through a period of time where I was super duper broke and super duper depressed. And I was literally living on my friend's couches because I, I couldn't, I, I was, I couldn't pay my rent. And so I was staying with a friend of mine who had this beautiful apartment and she, I was supposed to stay with her and when she wasn't there. And then all of a sudden her marriage fell apart. So she was there and she came home without her, her spouse. And she was falling apart in front of me. And I was going through my own crisis, but she was going through a crisis. And I was the first person there to be there for her. Right. And so I was super aware that I didn't have a lot of bandwidth because I was in like a financial and emotional crisis of my own, but I love this person and she needed help. So I just kept, I mean, of course I did things to take care of myself, but when she was sharing with me, I literally imagined space opening up in my heart and chest to like hold, literally hold, you know, to hold space for what she was sharing with me, but I wasn't like absorbing it. Mm -hmm. And so I just imagine for me, visualization is really helpful. Yep. Um, And so I just imagine the space opening wider in my heart. Mm -hmm. And then I've done the same thing with sometimes other Uh, sometimes like, you know, you might have a friend who is having something wonderful happen in her life and you're happy for her, but you're also jealous, right? (laughs) And so I've done the same thing in those situations where I just Mm -hmm. like imagine the space opening up wider in my heart and my chest when that's, when this, when somebody is telling me something and I'm feeling jealous, but I also really want to be, I just want to be in the space of being happy for them. So am I understanding you correctly? This is really fascinating and quite brilliant. Um, Are you saying that you visualize a new space opening to allow that space for them in that wasn't already within you, and then you kind of close it off to protect yourself from it? Oh, oh, that's an interesting... No, I don't think I'm closing anything off. For some reason, just the simplicity of expanding the space somehow serves me. Making more space yeah. than you But found. I would say, I mean, you do make a good point that, you know, because certainly sometimes as a very sensitive, intuitive person, I, I do sometimes absorb things that I- Yeah, that that's where I thought you were going. Yeah. Because that's, so, how, that's what we yeah. hear about. You know, you envision the white totally. light around you protecting you. Yeah. Like, you know. I mean, it was before I started doing that. I mean, I've always done like white light to protect me, like yeah. walking around the city or whatever, but in terms yeah. of like protecting my energy field yeah. at that time, I, <clears throat> I wasn't really doing that when I came up with this. Now I probably would, uh, for, for some sort of kind of calibration of my energy field, I do often like really feel into the, you know, feel my feet on the floor. Yeah. Sometimes I imagine a column of like golden white light around my body, a vertical column. Mm -hmm. Um, and those are kind of the two main things that I do or imagining like a golden egg, which I also learned from my mother, the golden, like just imagining golden egg around you. Um, and then if I have had a conversation or something, or even sometimes with a client, if I'm doing an intuitive reading, if I feel like I've taken something on, or even if I don't feel like I have, oftentimes I will just say like, anything that do, is not, does not serve me or anything that's not mine, you know, please take it now. And I'll mm-hmm. either like wash my hands and do that. Or mm-hmm. I'll, literally, I really like to do this kind of movement of like, I just like pushing it away, breathe it out and push it away okay, or shake yeah. it off or whatever. Um, dancing is really a big part of my, yep. right. It's Move like it out. for it everything out. Mm-hmm. really for, mm-hmm. for anger, for sadness, for pleasure, mm-hmm. for joy, for all of yep. it. Yep. Yeah. Emote. Yep. Yeah. Energy and motion. Hey, I'm here with my friend Ross Newkirk, and I know you've heard about his amazing core harmonizer because I talk about it all the time. And if you come over my house, you, like everyone else, will comment on, oh my God, what is that thing? It's so beautiful. I feel so calm and peaceful. Well, we're talking about crystals today and why they're important, why they're not all created the same. Ross, what did you want to share with us about the uniqueness of the Vogel cut crystal? Well, the uh, the Vogel cut crystal is actually uh, an amazing um crystal in that it's specific cut uh it's a double terminated crystal pointed on both ends um 
and uh, it allows for the amplification of uh, thought and intention and energy. And we actually utilize, um, we first started utilizing uh, the Vogel Cut Crystal in our technologies. Our nonprofit up in Western Massachusetts called the Lightfield Foundation um, has an amazing piece of technology in there that people lay in um, uh, that's uh, um, a sphere, uh, uh, Merkaba and uh, a cube that you lay in. And we use uh, Vogel Cut Crystals in that as well as in the core harmonizer and our cohere meditation mat and quantum flow unit. So we actually first started utilizing these um, crystals in our technologies and then started offering them as well to uh, to people um, for their own work. Energy healers love using uh, Vogel cut crystals as they can be used for inputting energy uh, into you know a client and, and situation, but also extracting as well. They actually resonate and vibrate um, uh, with the frequency of water and being that we're mostly made up of water. They're uh, the wonderful, wonderful tool for that. Such a precision cut. They, they, I can't believe they're handmade. They're just like uh, mathematically, geometrically perfect, super powerful. That's why I'm so grateful that I found Ross and his team and his beautiful company that makes these tools available to us and at discount. You guys, you can get yours at a discount on my website under the recommended products page. Just go down, you'll see the Vogel Cut Crystals. You can learn all about them. And don't forget, check out episode 105 if you want to learn even more. But when you're checking out, enter discount code FITAMYTV10 and you will save 10%. You know, this is really interesting because uh, we're hearing a lot about this kind of stuff with the people that are real empaths that are coming out and saying, you know, because there's so much buzz going on in the collective. You know, there's so much unrest. There's so much just heartache of like disillusionment going on and people feeling betrayed and yes. angry and lied to and uh plus the collective anxiety and you know the fear mongering um so we're hearing a lot about how we spiritually and psychologically protect ourselves um but still be there for others who need help so i find this very helpful uh do you feel well, are those a tactics that you do, Annie, because you do personal uh, intuitive readings now still? Yeah. Well, I've taken a break from them f- okay. fairly, you know, lately I've taken a break just because I'm busy um, building this other business. But, uh, you know, if one, if somebody needed a reading and I could make time for it, I would. Um, in terms of probably doing that more substantively, I probably, maybe I'd pick it up again in another few months or something. Um, sometimes I'll get on like my social media and just do a collect a reading on the collective, um, mm-hmm. like especially around a new or full moon or something. But anyway, so currently I am not actively doing that. Um, I took, a, well, actually I am going to tell you part of what happened in addition to building this other business is that I was getting some, uh, pushback around being an intuitive from some of my friend, my spiritual friends who had turned super Christian oh. and they were saying like that it was dangerous and da, 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 da. And it really, even though I wasn't totally sure I agreed with them, I, it threw me because everything, there's so much going on, right. That we're awakening to the darkness in so many places. And I've so, it's so important to me to be of service and not do any harm. So I just, I kind of didn't really know where I was with it. So that was also part of why I set it aside um, until I could come to more clarity. Understood, understood. Uh, But I'm just wondering if when you do do the intuitive readings, were the processes that you just shared with us part of your practice to prepare to be with the client, to get into the intuitive space, to get the reading, to get the download? No, because um, what I I actually open every session with a prayer and the the divine love meditation, which is calling in the Creator's will. So I feel like it's covered. Also, mm-hmm. that that divine love meditation is a healing meditation. So I'm experiencing that as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, the times when I would integrate it 
I mean, for one thing, I might share those practices with a client because of course, often, you know, like attracts like, so often I have people show up who also need help with those sorts of things. Um, Or occasionally if I've had a session where I was like, wow, that was really heavy. um, I might do a little extra clearing. Yeah. You know, probably I really should be doing it every day given how many people I'm interacting every every hour. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. This is just amazing. You know, I, as we're getting toward the end here, I, I'm really excited to have you come back for the part two of what we're going to talk about, about the new venture that you're on and, and, you know, where Annie is now with her new career and what's in it, you know, in relative to where we're at today and what particularly women need to know about, about being in our in our power and about being in our sovereignty and and what components we need to be able to to do that and and how to survive in in this new world order that we're all seeing. Um, so I'm excited to have you come back and talk with us about that. But but I before we get to the to, to kind of wrap here, I just would love to know when you pivoted when you left New York, um, the acting space. A lot of times, like when we, when we leave one, let's just say job or career, or, or when we want something like the, what I love, what I want to be an actress for is because I love performing and I love, you know, expressing and letting people feel something and, you know, what it was that drew you to, to acting or whatever it is, insert said love, passion, and then you didn't have it. So a lot of times what we say is, you try to identify what it was about that, the feeling that you thought you would have by being a prominent actress, a superstar. How can you, what was that feeling? So then you can parlay it into other areas of your life so you can have it now and still be fulfilled. So what was it that acting or being an actress would have given you uh, that you can now in your life that you're not in New York being an actress that you can find in other areas so you can be fulfilled? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I would say, um, I mean, certainly, so I have my moon in Leo in my chart, which means that I get emotional. I do truly, as much as I kind of resist it, I have, I get some degree of emotional nourishment from being center stage and performing Mm -hmm. in a way that's of service. Um, and so certainly in my current work that I do, I am presenting information to groups of people on a regular basis. So that kind of fills that to a degree. Um, I'm also part of what I love, loved about acting was being part of a team and an ensemble. I have that in what I'm doing now. The piece that I'm still, I mean, I, for me, it's, I guess the story isn't finished yet, right? Because yep. so I'm going to be doing a cabaret show here in Maine in August. Um, and because, you know, what happened was I set that stuff aside. And then last month or so, it became very clear to me that my soul was like, ah, yeah. right? About that. Yeah, yeah. So the other pieces yeah. that are still I'm working out are, um, it's... <sighs> It's maybe a little bit less about the career itself and more about the action, the process, the, the, the work, right? And it comes back to what I talked about before that um, the craft of acting, the, the, there's a transcendence. When you're really on, when you're really in it, there's like a transcendence and there's like a there's a um, surrender and you're, mm-hmm. it's like channeling basically. You're, you're going down the river. You're just yeah, like, exactly. yeah, you're just on yes. the raft. And yes. yeah. mm-hmm. And I you're love flow. that. And also yeah, for sure. like the way that stories and, and music and to me, so much of it is about like, you open your heart to give other people permission to open their hearts. Yeah. And that's like so sacred to me. And I feel yeah. like the world needs it more than ever right? Because so much, did you listen to, I can send it to you, but Greg Braden did this wonderful talk recently. It's on YouTube about like, I think he calls it this 
how the social contracts have been broken or something. Oh. And he talks about how divided we become, right? Mm, yes. Two and camps. to me, I'm like, if we could just get more of us into our hearts and remember that we're all human, mm-hmm. you know, what, regardless of who you voted for or whatever. So um, how this comes into what I'm doing now, I'm not quite sure yet. I mean, sometimes I might sing at the end of my presentations, like, like we, like you yep. witnessed that one time. That and great. then I'm, um, working on, like I said, this show for August so that I have another outlet for it. Uh, and you know, down the line, who knows, I may collaborate with other like-minded artists and make our own like films who, I don't know. I, but to me that at the end of the day, the main thing is the more that I can be in like that heart space, yeah. And in that channeling kind of flow, then it kind of doesn't matter what the context is. Well, and I think you did answer it because you said, you know, there's there's a huge component of because uh, you're giving presentations. And of course, you're let's just start with the foundation of you're fully in your integrity. You believe in yes. your business and what you're doing. Yes. You know in your heart it's helping people and it's legitimate and it's tangible and um, and you have, you are on a team, you know, I mean, so it's, it's checking a lot of the boxes, you know, um, and then you get your cabaret coming in a few months. So, so you get that outlet. So yeah, so you got it covered. Well, I am super excited to share with people all what we're, what we're kind of been alluding to. Sorry, everyone listening and watching, but like, um, it? yeah, you're going to have to join us because, you know, we're, we're both on this new venture of finding, um, financial sovereignty and, and just personal sovereignty. Do you want to give us a, just a little teaser on that, Annie, sure. of what we're going to share with people and um, this new venture that you're yeah. on and that I'm, I'm following behind you on this regard? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it has to do with gold and silver, which many people believe to be God's money. Yeah. And as most of us who are paying attention are aware, the our economy is in an interesting place. And so it makes sense to look at ways to hedge against that. And gold and silver have very, uh, they have really interesting healing qualities and vibrations to them. And this particular resource that we uh, can share with people who want to learn about it is a beautiful way to access God's money in like a fun way. It's easy. It's safe. It's educational. It gives you empowering. It gives you empowering information. And I just think that understanding what re- what is real money and what's not real money is so uh, wise right now. And then putting that into action. And, and it also, there's a community aspect that's so beautiful. And for me, this is really the first, and I won't go into a lot of detail about it right now, but um, what I will say is that this is the most that I, most consistently I have ever prioritized um, my financial well-being as a top priority. It's, was, it just hasn't been my top priority for a long time. And I find that, I've found that it is incredibly grounding Mm. and healing and freeing and going back to this channeling flow state and the feminine that I know so much of so much of your show is about mm-hmm. i find that creating that kind of masculine container of financial sovereignty financial understanding and financial abundance is really nurturing to make space for that more feminine flow Beautifully said. I couldn't have said that better myself, even if I just got a download. That was absolutely gorgeous. For so everybody, you've got to come back to the second part of our discussion. And uh I'll tell you in the show notes, there's a link there to a special landing page if you want to find out more. If you just can't wait for that, go ahead and just check out the show notes. The link is there. If you forget, it's on my website on the main page there on financial freedom, because I'm involved as well. And I'm so glad you mentioned the whole community element of this, uh, of this organization, Annie, because, you know, really at the end of the day, that's what it's about. That's what, that's what I've learned. That's what I learned from my father's death years ago was, uh, you know, he was a man of deep integrity and quite a, a a well-respected businessman in town. But I was really struck by 
what I learned the most from him was the value of relationships, the amount of people that came out of nowhere to say something, to come to his wake, to, you know, just to talk like, you know, your father would do business on a handshake and, you know, the old fashioned way, and they don't make them like that anymore. And the things that people said. So what I'm getting at is I really learned a hard lesson about, remember, it's about relationships. At the end of the day, that's it. That's all we got is our, our, are people that mean something in our heart or the things that mean something in our heart. And we have to live on our feet. We have to. We have to put our money where our mouth is. And what I love about what you and I are involved in with this financial resource community is that these are all heart-based people that truly have the intent to help other people in a significant way, not just with, you know, lip service, but like in a way that will literally help them be more sovereign and have more control of their life and their resources with something that's actually tangible, which is a precious metal, as opposed to something that's, you know, fake and, and digital or not even a real thing. Yeah. Something that's grounded. Yeah. Yeah. Love and it. It, yeah. So yeah. Well, okay. So I, we don't want to get too that. far ahead of it. So <laughs> everybody come back for it, catch that episode. And uh, Annie, any last thoughts on your heart today? Because we thank you for sharing so much wisdom, so much of your vulnerable truth. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for your wonderful questions and beautiful listening. It's an op- uh, wonderful to have a, have a, have a chance to share. Um, and I hope that it's been of use to somebody listening and I guess the, yeah, my main thing that I'm doing is the piece that we're going to talk about in the next episode, but, and that you can learn about if you click on that landing page. That being said, if you want to know later about the cabaret show, or if you want to be on the waiting list for intuitive stuff, you can find me on Instagram at at, at ancmoller, A-N-N-C-M-O-L-L-E-R, or you can just email me at callthemuse at gmail.com great email address that is. When you sent that to me, I was like, wait, what? Oh, wow. I get it. Yeah. That's awesome. That's really great. You know, speaking into being Annie, speaking into being. (laughs) Um, I love it. Okay, everyone, please do check out Annie's amazing Instagram page and her work. And uh, like I said, just uh, make sure you subscribe to Awakening Aphrodite so you get notified when Annie's back on the show. And we two women are going to share with you our experience with gaining financial health and sovereignty and why you need to too so you can really have that grounded space to work from, to jump off from, to be in your feminine flow, to feel good, to feel confident and have the life that we all want. So join us for that. And uh, Annie Mahler, thank you for being on the show. Everybody, we'll see you next time on Awakening Aphrodite. Bye-bye. My pleasure. Thank you. Would you like to support my mission to help empower people all over the world to be all of who they truly are? If so, please subscribe to the show, leave a review on iTunes, and share it with a friend. And if you're looking to take immediate action to align your energy and optimize your health, visit amyfournier.com. Thanks for listening to Awakening Aphrodite. Let's awaken her together in you. I'm your hostess, Amy Fournier. And I already can't wait to be with you again and for you to hear what I have planned for the next show. Thanks for listening to Awakening Aphrodite with Amy Fournier. To learn more about Amy, check out her website, amyfournier.com. That's A-M-Y-F-O-U-R-N-I-E-R.com. You can also check out Amy's live and on-demand virtual fitness and yoga classes and sign up for her newsletter to receive a free mini ebook of three of her top tips for making holistic health a lifestyle. Again, that's amyfournier.com and get your ebook sent to your email immediately. Connect with Amy on the daily on Instagram at fitamytv, F-I-T-A-M-Y-T-V, and watch many of the podcast episodes and subtopic clips on her YouTube channel, which is also fitamytv. Enjoy, and we'll see you next time on Awakening Aphrodite.